Hello, and welcome back to Checkmate Alton Shea, the series where I begin staring deeply into the darkness, wondering, fearing, guessing about my own sanity after watching these videos. Today, we'll be looking into the seventh episode of Checkmate Lincolnites. Did the Confederacy have better generals? This video, unlike the previous ones, is well over 40 minutes long, so for your sake, as well as my sake, I will be breaking this video down into two parts. This is made all the easier because his video can be broken down into two distinct arguments. In this first part, we will be covering the argument made by Alton Shea concerning the importance of manpower and resources during the war, how much of an impact they made, and the general issues with his strategic argumentation. With that being said, let us begin. Amateurs talk about tactics, but professionals study logistics. This line was said by Marine Corps General Robert H. Barrow in 1979. The statement best describes how war, across the whole of human history, functions. In war, logistics dictates all of the other factors involved, determining strategy and, ultimately, the tactical decisions made on the battlefield to achieve those strategic aims. Tactics, strategy, and logistics are all tied together in determining how a nation will wage a war and how that nation were to best achieve victory in said war. With this point in mind, we first need to understand the logistical situation both sides of the American Civil War faced during the onset of the war to then better understand their strategies. First, we need to look at the population disparity. For this, I'll be enlisting a few volunteers to help visualize the disparities of both sides. <clears throat> Mr. Nini. Yes! All right, you'll be representing the population of the South. Okay. Now, Mr. Cow. Yes, Mr. Boots. You'll be representing the northern population for this example. Finally, uh, Mr. Crow. Call! What do you need? You'll be standing in for the non-combatant parties for both sides. That's it? Yes, that's it. At least for now. With that being said, let me give you guys a brief overview of the population disparity between the North and South. According to the census of 1860, the southern states that would eventually secede from the Union would have a total population of roughly 9 to 9.5 million people, which I have represented with nine Mr. Ninis. The states that would remain within the Union had a combined population total of over 23 million people, which I've represented with 23 Mr. Cows. To put this into a percentage value, roughly 71% of the total population of the United States lived in the northern states compared to only 29% for the southern states that would secede. Wow! That seems unfair! This, however, doesn't account for the non-combatants on both sides of the conflict. For the southern side, we have to account for 4 million black people in the south, roughly 85% to 90% of whom were enslaved. This disqualified them from frontline roles during the war up until March 1865. We then have to exclude a further 2.5 million people from this figure due to them being women. Women were also ineligible for military service, often being relegated to logistical duties or working in factory or agricultural jobs. This leaves the South with roughly 2 to 2.5 million men eligible for military service at some point in their life. For the North, we have to do much the same. Of the 23 million people the North had, 
50% were ineligible for military service due to them being women. However, unlike the South, they could tap into a wider pool of their manpower and, due to them having a significantly lower black population, could tap into it fully throughout the war, further expanding it to include the free black population by 1863. This leaves the North with 11.5 million potential recruits versus the South's roughly 2 to 2.5 million potential recruits, a disparity of 5.75 to 1. This is certainly unfair, Mr. Nini. Why can't I fight? Call! From here, we should talk about the industrial capacity between the North and South. The North had roughly 92% of the total industrial workforce and overall industrial output of the nation prior to the American Civil War, leaving the South with only 8% in both categories. Between 1800 and 1860, the total share of the northern population working in agriculture had dropped from 70% down to 40%, many of whom went on to move to major urban centers such as New York City to work in industrial jobs, ranging from iron manufacturing, ship manufacturing, locomotive works, arms manufacturing, and so on and so forth. For infrastructure, the northern states had seen over 22,000 miles of railway lines laid down compared to the south's roughly 9,000 miles of track. In no uncertain terms, the northern states had every single major advantage concerning industrial capacity, transportation capacity, and population, all of which would be necessary in waging a considerable war effort. Then how did the South manage to survive for four years? That, my friendly Irish cow, is a valid question that is worth discussing in the next part. For now, you three can go about your day. Okay. I'm giving some ketamine. <laughs> okay then, Mr. Boots. Let us know if we'll be needed further. Don't worry. I'll let you guys know. This should give you a good idea of the situation the southern states faced during the American Civil War. Such a significant disparity in resources, manpower, and transportation capacity should normally result in the side with the deficit losing quite handily. Take, for instance, the Chechenian Wars, where the Chechens were annihilated twice by the Russians, even after the collapse of the Soviet Union, due to the significant disparity in resources, manpower, and logistical services available to both sides. However, this did not happen during the American Civil War. Rather, the northern states struggled for four years to defeat the South, and at a significant cost of 300,000 to 400,000 men for the North. So, why did this happen? This question, for the time being, is beyond the scope of this video, but it's worth keeping in mind for now. However, I wish to address a number of points brought up by Alton Shea in the video. One of the first arguments he makes concerning the logistics issue comes from a quotation from Lee's farewell address, which he follows up by stating the following. Until after four years of arduous service, marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, we were compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. Oh, I see what you're doing there. You're quoting Lee's farewell address after his surrender at Appomattox. You know, it's interesting because with the very verbiage of that address, Lee abrogates his own personal responsibility for defeat. It was all just overwhelming numbers and resources. No other reason, certainly not Confederate mismanagement or the competency and skill of the United States Army. I mean, no, 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 that would be crazy. The issue with this argument is it ignores the context behind it. Lee's army, at the time of his surrender at Appomattox, was 20,000 to 25,000 men strong, compared to Grant's forces, which consisted of 100,000 to 120,000 men of the Army of the Potomac and another 55,000 men of the Army of the James, giving him a rough total of 155,000 to 175,000 men, of which 60 to 65,000 were at Appomattox, still conferring him a numbers advantage of 3 to 1. 
In fact, Lee was outright surrounded at Appomattox due to the fact that Grant's forces could surround him due to their decisive numbers advantage. When the situation is placed into its context, the statement is not an obfuscation of responsibility, but an outright statement of fact. Lee was not done in by any special tactics or maneuvers, but had been completely surrounded and overwhelmed by sheer numbers. No matter the skill level of Lee, he could never overcome such a decisive advantage in numbers with his starving, exhausted army. Shortly after this, the topic I've already addressed earlier is brought up concerning northern industrial capacity, to which Ottenshe retorts such advantages by listing the following examples. Actually, uh, a really interesting tidbit, but, you know, God isn't always on the side of the biggest battalions. History is full of wars where the side with the lower population and fewer resources won. You know, the Haitian Revolution, uh, the uh, Vietnam War, the Winter War, the list goes on. Hell, I think you guys had a better chance of beating us in the Civil War than we had of beating the British in the Revolutionary War, and once or twice, he almost did. The three examples he listed here have a number of issues with them, which I will break down point for point. First, the Haitian Revolution, otherwise known as the Haitian Slave Revolt, succeeded because France was in the middle of the French Revolution before Napoleon took over, leading the country to fight virtually everyone around them. In fact, during the same time period, Napoleon sold off vast tracts of land to the fledgling United States through the Louisiana Purchase, because he needed the money for building more warships, and because he couldn't realistically hold on to most of the French holdings in the New World. Haiti managed to slip by through the turmoil due to it being an ocean away during the most chaotic time period in European history. It's the same reason why Mexico, Colombia, Bolivia, Panama, and many other Spanish holdings gained their independence as well. Spain was too busy being occupied by both the French and the British to stop their revolutions. Second, the Vietnam War was not an outright victory for the North Vietnamese. In fact, the United States fought the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong into a stalemate, forcing them into a ceasefire similar to what had happened in Korea. Even so, the Viet Cong and NVA were not fighting all by their lonesome against the United States. They were receiving regular supply shipments from the Soviet Union, who supplied them with weaponry, tanks, surface-to-air missile systems, and, most important of all, MiG-21s. All of these things proved to be a major thorn in the side of the U.S. military, Couple this with the political nature of the war, with Lyndon B. Johnston dragging his feet throughout much of it, and it becomes clear as to why the U.S. did not see instant success. Third, and finally, the Winter War was a Finnish defeat. In fact, this last point was one that Alton Shea had to openly admit he got wrong, as countless viewers pointed out the inaccuracy of claiming it was a victory for the Finns. The Soviet Union, though they suffered exceptionally high casualties during the conflict, still achieved in obtaining their goal of securing Karelia and Sala from the Finns. Additionally, the Soviets would again defeat the Finnish forces during the Continuation War, a war started by the Finns in conjunction with Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union during Operation Barbarossa in 1941. In both cases, the Finns lost the war, in spite of failures in Soviet high command, because the Soviets still had an overwhelming force and would eventually break through the Mannerheim line due to the decisive factor the numbers game plays in these conflicts. He also mentions the tidbit about the South having a better chance against the North than the United States did during the War for Independence. 
In this case, it's worth noting that the War for Independence was won due to French intervention into the war. The entry of the French decisively swung the war in the favor of the newly formed United States because Britain had to contend with a major European power with a large, formidable navy that was on their doorstep and had a vast colonial empire. In fact, the Siege of Yorktown was made possible mainly due to the Battle of the Chesapeake Bay, where the Royal Navy was decisively defeated by the French Navy, thereby cutting off Lord Cornwallis from the rest of the British forces. There is a common trend among all of these smaller nations that won against the larger forces. In order for these nations to win, one of two things must occur. 1. The larger nation in question must be going through political or social crisis back at home, thereby reducing their capabilities in responding to every single crisis. 2. The smaller nation must be receiving direct support from foreign powers in order to level the playing field and make up for any shortcomings. Without either one of these factors, the smaller nation is going to lose, and will lose considerably. This is why the South lobbied heavily in Europe in order to have some form of recognition. If the South were to win the war, they would have to be recognized by a major European power, and have them intervene on their behalf to settle the matter. Without foreign support, the South was going to lose the war. The question from there would be a matter of when, rather than if. Jumping ahead a bit in the video, he goes on to discuss the factor of how the governing system of the South and North and its impact on the war. In it, he states the following. In the 20s and 30s, historian Frank L. Osley argued that the Confederacy had, quote, died of states' rights. Our commitment to freedom was too great that our states could not coordinate under a strong central power, and it hamstrung our war effort. What are your thoughts? Owsley's full of shit. First off, his entire premise is a fiction. I mean, sure, Davis clashed with governors over stuff like troop allocations for local defense, but these were outlying events, the importance of which he greatly exaggerated. But more importantly, I just don't buy that the Confederacy's internal divisions were responsible for its defeat. The North had to deal with internal division that was just as, if not more intense than anything the South had to deal with. I mean, you take the 1863 draft riots, for instance, or the intense pressure on the Lincoln administration throughout the war for swift and spectacular battlefield victories, or the political polarization that followed the Emancipation Proclamation. Talk about hamstringing the war effort. No, any way you slice it, the Confederacy lost the Civil War on the field of battle. The Lincoln administration outmaneuvered them politically, and the boys in blue annihilated them militarily. Sometimes when you start a bar fight, you end up on the floor. It happens. Now, I personally found this statement baffling. This statement contradicts his previous statements in other videos regarding the issues of centralization within the Confederacy and its contribution to the war effort. For instance, I distinctly recall Jefferson Davis making a similar remark concerning the Confederate war effort, which Shelton Shea himself referenced in his previous videos. There isn't any question that the South's political system caused issues with the logistic system, as the Confederate States of America had given the states greater autonomy compared to their northern counterparts, creating much the same situation as seen during the American War for Independence or during the War of 1812, where Massachusetts initially refused to allocate troops to the war effort. So why, then, does he contradict himself here? Well, my speculation to this comes down to him not actually making the effort to remain consistent and, instead, quoting directly from his choice source for the video. For example, episode 2 of this series heavily based itself on Marching Masters as a main source. Episode 6 heavily relied upon the works of Kevin Levin regarding black confederates, including his narrow definition of the term. These videos heavily rely upon using specific secondary sources and simply regurgitate that information with little, if any, regard to consistency between the videos. 
This is simply laziness on Otten Shea's part. We now need to make a considerable jump to address a point that's interspersed between two separate sections. First, Alton Shea makes the following statement when touching upon Joe Johnston. Most other rebel generals thought of war in terms of attacking or defending dots on a map. They were very geographic in the way they went about it, but Johnston understood that when you're outnumbered and outgunned, stubbornly holding on to bits of dirt can often be counterproductive. Maneuver, even strategic retreat, can be much more beneficial in the long run. He then goes on to say the following in regards to Lee's generalship and actions during the war. Nonsense. Protecting Richmond and our center of government was essential to our survival as a nation. Okay, but while Lee was busy defending Virginia to the last, Sherman snuck up behind him and rammed a boot up his ass. It was a losing strategy, and Lee is more culpable than you realize. For what shall it profit a man if he gains Virginia, but loses the whole South? I wish to discuss these two sections as one because both are related to the same argument. Namely, Alton Shea is arguing that it was somehow foolish for these generals to stubbornly defend these areas, but what he leaves out is the important context behind those dots on a map. Let's take Richmond, Virginia as the prime example of why these dots were so important. Richmond, Virginia contained within it the Confederate laboratories on Browns Island, which produced most of the ammunition the Army of Northern Virginia needed to fight the war, the only locomotive works in the South, and Tredegar Iron Works, one of the few places that could manufacture cannons, rifles, and any other form of equipment requiring iron. It was one of the most populated cities in the Confederacy, containing a population of around 50,000 people, which, combined with Petersburg, were some of the most populated regions in the Confederacy. Richmond was also a major railway hub. Five railway lines intersected in the city, including the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad, the Richmond and York River Railroad, the Richmond and Danville Railroad, the Richmond and Petersburg Railroad, and the Virginia Central Railroad. Richmond was also the only city in the Confederacy that had easy access to coal via the Chesterfield coal mines to the south and west of the city, a vital resource for the production of iron as well as fueling other industries in the city. This doesn't get into the dockyards along the Rockets Landing, the state armories in the city, or the significance of holding a major center 100 miles away from Washington, D.C. To put it simply, Richmond was no mere dot on a map. Richmond was central in maintaining the Confederate war effort. If Richmond fell, then Virginia would fall as well as any chances of the Confederacy maintaining the war, let alone winning it. To put this into context, losing Richmond would have been the equivalent of the Soviet Union losing Moscow, Imperial Japan losing Tokyo, the United Kingdom losing London, or France losing Paris during the Second World War. It would not only be a major blow to the overall war-waging capabilities of the Confederacy, but a major morale blow that would be hard, if not impossible, to recover from. From a logistical standpoint, Richmond had to be defended at all costs. This is why Lee stubbornly defended the city in 1864, and why Lee conducted many of his counteroffensives in 1862 and 1863. They were done in an effort to ensure the protection of his main supply base, the one city that had to be protected in order for him to continue to wage the war. The same argument carries over for most every strategic point in the South. Atlanta, New Orleans, Vicksburg, Savannah, Columbia, Charleston, Norfolk, Gordonsville, Lynchburg, Petersburg, Fredericksburg, and so on and so forth were vital locations as they were important either due to their manufacturing capabilities, their major roadway or railway networks, or for other reasons. For instance, Charlottesville and Gordonsville, though very small towns, 
were of vital strategic importance due to their railway networks running through them and due to the large medical facilities, both pre-existing and set up during the war, such as the Exchange Hotel in Gordonsville or the University of Virginia campus in Charlottesville. Without these locations, the war could not be waged. I emphasize this point because what Alton Shea is doing here is downplaying the importance of these major strategic locations. Locations, such as Richmond, are not just bits of dirt or dots on a map. They represent far more than simply that. Major urban centers are key in winning a war, especially a technologically advanced war, as we see with Napoleonic and later modern wars. In order to be able to wage an effective war, you need to have production facilities, logistics networks, and manpower in order to wage it. This leads me to the main crux of Alton Shea's argument. His main purpose behind downplaying the importance of logistics in waging a war is so he can set up his main line of argumentation that the South lost due to bad leadership rather than the obvious problem. Overwhelming numbers, resources, and a significant transportation system to move those resources. It cannot be understated just how important logistics is towards war-waging capabilities and how those factors determine the outcome of a war. To best encapsulate all of this, the South was the equivalent of an unarmed man having to fend off five men armed with switchblade knives. The odds are heavily stacked against the man, meaning that any criticism of the man's capabilities simply due to him losing to such long odds is misplaced. This leaves us with the question the video initially prompted. Did the Confederacy have better generals? What of the North's generalship? How much blame can be placed upon these commanders for the success and failure of any given campaign? This is what Alton she attempts to answer with his rather limited understanding of the men he comments on. However, that will have to wait for part two, where we will tackle the generals themselves and reveal just how deceitful Alton Shea truly is. I hope all of you have had a wonderful day, and may God bless all of you.